So the bus build is in full swing, and if you haven't been able to catch up with the entire build series, you can go back and check the link in the description, or the one that is right here, to check out the entire build series. But today, it's just one of those days that I woke up and I went through my comment feed, and I was kind of like, man, these, some of these questions are just like, they're going to take like paragraphs, or they're going to take like, they're going to take like a year to answer. And I thought, you know, instead of trying to just write out this comment to one person and trying to answer it, why not just make a Q&A video? We go through the comments together and answer some of the main questions that people are asking. Some will be rapid fire, some are going to be more in depth, but we're just going to see where this ends up. So without any further ado, let's jump into the questions. I don't know why I pointed over there. All right, so the easiest way to do this, I think, is gonna be going video by video through the build series and then just kind of seeing what questions are in the comments, answering them one by one, and seeing what we come up with here. Without further ado, whenever my phone loads. So question number one, when we're looking through here, how difficult is it to go from driving a minivan to driving a five window school bus? Honestly, I don't think it's probably really that different. If you really wanna if you really want to think about the difference between a minibus and a short bus, simply it just has a different back. I mean, if you're talking about a soccer mom minivan, yeah, that's going to drive a bit more like a car. But if you're talking about kind of more a Sprinter van or a Dodge Ram van or any of those, you're pretty much dealing with a similar chassis size, a similar width, uh, similar length. So for the most part, if you're comfortable with driving one of those, you're probably going to be fine with a short bus. If anyone out there, just to kind of push the question a little bigger, is looking to buy a big bus, and you're kind of worried about, am I going to be able to drive a big bus? My, one of my big suggestions I always throw out to people is maybe you go to a company like U-Haul or rent a truck or whatever is in your local area and go rent one of their big trucks, one of their moving trucks. Because if you're going to be comfortable driving one of those, then you're going to be comfortable driving a school bus because those are pretty much the same chassis size. They're going to have a big block diesel engine in it. And it's going to give you a little bit of familiarity with kind of seeing the mirrors and uh, driving around a couple places. If you're not comfortable, I don't suggest driving into cities. Maybe go out into the country, take a good drive. Uh, but that's definitely something you can consider to kind of give yourself the feel before you jump into actually buying a school bus. Let's look at and see what other questions might be on here. Whoa. <laughs> I know this question right here is going to be one that I'm probably going to find a lot, so I'll probably just answer it right now, and then we might just scroll past it in the future, but where did you look to find your school bus? So the little bus I actually found on Facebook Marketplace, and uh, it just popped up. I just I tend to just scroll through different forums and uh, different Facebook Marketplace feeds around the country and just looking to see what's posted, just see where the market's at, see what things are getting priced taught. Uh, if there's a good deal, maybe I'll buy it. I mean, it's really just uh, something that I'm consistently doing and consistently looking at just to see what's out there on the market. But for you out there, if you're looking to buy a school bus, uh, I, I'm sure that I could probably make an entire video about where to find and how to find buses. But in terms of right now, really good places to start looking. Facebook Marketplace, uh, you can look on Craigslist, you can look at local forums, uh, schoolie forums, uh, Bus Life Adventure. I know on his website he posts some classifieds. Uh, government auctions, uh, school districts, church groups, boys and girls clubs. I mean, all these places are going to be using school buses for service, which means when they're done with them, they're going to be putting them up for sale. So I know for the local district that I'm currently in, they sell their buses off after 10 years, and you can actually just go buy it straight from the district before it ends up in an auction house or it's sold off to a used bus dealer. So maybe it's an opportunity just to go ask around, talk around, and try to figure out where in your local area a good bus might be. If not, honestly, surfing the web is what I do every day, uh, just kind of looking through all the forums and trying to see what's out there. So uh, it's one of those things that it is definitely the hardest decision you have to make because once you buy the bus, that's the beginning of the journey. But take your time in trying to find the right one and the best one for you. All right, let's see what other questions might be out there. Boom, that's a good question right there. Do you need a different license to insure it? Uh, I'm gonna kind of broaden that question a little bit. Do you need a different license to insure it and to drive a school bus? This is actually a video that I'm currently working on at the moment of filming this is, do you need a CDL for a, to drive a school bus? Do you need to register it a certain way? How can you actually go through that process? Uh, I'm currently actually filming an entire video on that, but to give a quick answer is, no, you typically do not need a CDL to buy and drive a school bus home in most states in the US. There are guidelines, federal guidelines and state guidelines that you have to check out for your particular area, um, which like I said, I'm gonna be going into another video pretty in depth into those types of discussions. But for you right now, if you're watching this video and you don't wanna go check out the other one, nine times out of 10, the answer is gonna be no, you do not need a CDL to drive a school bus. There are exceptions to that, I will say. How did you find a short bus? Do they have lots of miles? Can't wait to see the conversion. 
I'm going to take that question and I'm going to look at it because we kind of already answered where, where we might find a school bus. Do they have lots of miles on them? Mileage in school buses. Uh, I think sometimes it's hard to accept the fact that most buses are going to have a lot of miles on them, but you have to remember that the engines are built differently. We're not looking at, you know, a Honda Civic or a uh, Toyota Camry or your typical daily driver car, where when you start seeing 150, 100, 200,000 miles, that's a pretty old car. It's probably pretty used. It's got a lot of miles on it. But with a school bus, uh, that's that's fairly normal. It's, it's gonna be pretty hard to find buses under 100,000 miles. There's not a crazy amount of them out there that I've seen. Uh, I mean, I, I do have one. My little bus actually has 77,000 miles on it. And I did previously buy a bus that had 35,000 miles on it. But it's not super common because these buses are going on routes every day, of course. They're driving kids to school typically. So if you're finding one from a school district, it's most likely gonna have a lot of miles on it. But with that said, they're also maintained differently than your commuter car. They're also uh, made to go for a lot more miles. The engines are built for that type of driving. So when I look at school buses, I'm more looking at the condition and the maintenance records of the bus rather than necessarily just the miles because a bus that's really taken care of and the school district is changing the oil and they're changing the filters and they're servicing the engine, I'm not too concerned about 150 or 200,000 miles at that point because most likely it's been taken care of in a really good proper way. Now, if you go look at a school bus with 200,000 miles and the entire engine bay is just rust coated and there's surface rust on everything, that's probably not something that I'm gonna to wanna to get into just because I'm gonna put my bet that they probably didn't service the engine well, they probably didn't take care of it well over the life of the bus, and it's not gonna result in a good bus in the long run. But that's honestly something you're just gonna to have to gauge by going out and physically looking at buses. That's gonna be the best way for you to learn. All right, I think that's I think that's actually all the questions for that video. We're gonna go on to the next one. So this video is the pre-bus conversion tour. So this video was looking at specifically what the bus was like and some of the specs before I actually even started doing the video. So uh, or started doing the conversion. So if you want to check that video out and get a bunch of numbers and specs on the bus, the year, the make, the model, the size, uh, that video is gonna have everything for you if you're asking any of those questions. But we're gonna go through the comments and check some real questions that you've currently asked. Okay, I like this one. This, this, is, a, this is a good question. Will your fridge fit over the wheel wells? So I can actually answer this one because the fridge right back there behind me is actually on top of the wheel wells. And let's actually, we can go check out the bus and measure it out and I can show you. All right, if we look at the short bus, I'm gonna measure up from the wheel well to the top so you can kind of get an idea on this model. So this is obviously not framed out, so you still got to account for framing and wood. But from the wheel well to the roof is exactly 69 inches on this school bus. So we're still gonna be building this out about uh, probably with two by fours so about inch and a half here and then up on the roof we're gonna have our furring strips and spray foam so we're gonna lose about an inch and a half so the distance from our finished roof to what's eventually gonna be the top of the wheel well is probably gonna end up around 65 to like 67 inches in this model school bus just for reference in terms of if you're looking to put a full-size stand-up fridge in this school bus I'd have about 67 inches um, if you're doing a chest freezer or a cabinet you're totally fine, you got the room so you can install that. But let's go over to the big bus and uh, check out where that fridge is and what the measurements are on that one. So now that we're here on the big bus, you can see that the fridge in this bus, of course, is already built, so it's already built in. But this fridge is directly on top of the wheel well. And if I look at the bottom, obviously the floor is already in, which I know is about a three inch floor with foam. We're about 10 inches off the bottom of the fridge. So that means from essentially the bottom of the metal if your bus is gutted to the top of here, is about probably 13 inches from the metal floor of the bus. From floor to ceiling on this built out bus, we're looking at about mm, six foot one, of, yeah, about six foot one. So essentially what that means is on this model, this is a 10.4 cubic foot fridge. It fits completely upright on top of the wheel well. I will say that when we built this bus, the back edge, because it is curved of the school bus, is like almost perfectly touching the metal. So you are gonna to wanna to consider the fact that you're putting a square object into a curved roof because if you want it to get perfectly flush to the ceiling height, you're actually gonna end up hitting the curve of the bus and it's not gonna work. So make sure you get your measurements right. But in terms of dealing with wheel wells as the general question, um, you can totally build on top of the wheel wells. Just remember that uh, you're not gonna have your metal to metal measurement. You're gonna be dealing with after you fur in your uh, wood and after you fur in your subfloor and that's actually gonna be the measurements you're working with. So just consider that when you're thinking about where to put your fridge, where to put your oven, cabinets, closets, things of that nature. But yeah, you could totally put a fridge on top of your wheel well.
I like that question. That was a good one. Technical. Where did you find this gem? I found this gem on Facebook Marketplace. Um, you've probably answered this one in one of your videos, but how tall are you? Uh, this is a good question because I'm sure a lot of you out there are watching my videos and you're saying to yourself like, hey, it looks like he's standing in his bus pretty good, but how tall is he? And what is that in reference to the actual ceiling height of the school bus? And I actually wanna look at this one, so let's go check this one out. In reference to how tall I am and how tall of a school bus you might be wondering, because honestly in videos you don't know how tall I am, so it looks like I have a bunch of room for, but for all you know, I'm five foot two. The truth is I'm five foot 10 and that the floor to ceiling of this bus unfinished is six foot four, which means after I do my subfloor and I spray foam about three inches, this bus is gonna end up with probably around a six foot to six foot one actual ceiling height. But if we actually go over to the big bus, I can show you cause that one's obviously finished and the factory height from that bus was actually the same. So let's go check that bus out and see how a five foot 10 person fits in that one. So now that we're in the big bus, you can see that I'm five foot 10 and I got about two or three inches above my head. So I haven't actually measured the ceiling height but it's about a six one interior ceiling. But that's after we did our insulation, our finished board, and then we built up our subfloor and put our final flooring on. So after you add up all those measurements, you are gonna be losing some of that original height. So do consider that. So if you're looking to actually have you know, a six foot four ceiling and you don't wanna do a roof raise, then you might have to give up some insulation room to be able to get that height inside the school bus. But if you are someone who's looking for more ceiling height and that you're just not gonna find it in that six four interior from an original school bus, you might have to start looking into doing a roof raise, which is a whole new ball game. All right, we're in the comment feed of the video called Seats Are Out, uh, converting a new school bus. So we are looking at taking the seats out and different questions during deconstruction. So let's look at what we got here. Uh, Andrea asks, how many miles per gallon is, going, is it going to save you from moving a big bus to a short bus? This is a good question uh, because you would probably assume that going from a big bus to a small bus, it's going to be a huge increase in gas savings. And that would be a bad assumption because the truth is, is the bus that I'm currently sitting in, when I originally bought it, it was getting about five miles per gallon. And for the technical people out there who wanna know about the gear ratios, my rear transmission, or my rear differential was running a 533. And I switched that out and replaced it with a 411. And what that did was actually gave me a big increase in gas mileage. And now I'm seeing around nine to 11 miles per gallon. And that's what this bus is currently getting as a 37 foot big old school bus. The little bus, uh, due to its ratio right now and the way that it's driving, uh, that bus actually only gets about 10 to 12 miles per gallon. So that bus is 21 feet long exterior, this one's 37. The other bus weighs about half as much as this one and the truth is I'm only saving about you know one to two miles per gallon uh, going from the big bus to the short bus. So I'm not really seeing a huge increase in terms of savings there. Uh, if that's gonna be one of your big motivating factors, you might wanna look more towards like the Sprinter vans, the Dodge Ram vans, uh, things that are gonna get more towards like the 18 to 22 miles per gallon, uh, maybe even sometimes higher in some models. But in terms of school buses, if you're able to even like touch 15, you're killing it. Boom, 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 boom. Here's another question. How much did the bus cost? The big bus that I'm currently sitting in when I bought it on the used bus market, it was $35,000. And the little bus that I'm currently converting, that one I bought for $2,500. And that does not include like taxes, fees, registration. That was just like flat out purchase price uh, of what I actually bought the bus for. Both buses in my state, I ended up spending, I think about $500 for taxes and registration and everything. So overall, this bus ended up costing me about $4,000 to get it done in the driveway. And the little bus cost about $3,000 to get it in the driveway, ready to go, um, all paid for. Let's find another question. Let's find another question. There's got to be one in here somewhere. Come on. Ooh. So the next question, have you ever tried those vinyl erase wheels? And the answer is yes. I've used them quite a bit before on other bus projects. On this project and in this video, I didn't have any available to me. And uh, in that case, I didn't, I didn't end up going with that option. I used a heat gun and a razor blade. And my bus was in pretty clean condition, so the vinyl actually came off pretty simply, and I didn't really need a vinyl erase wheel anyway. But if you're interested, they are phenomenal, and they are a great option for getting the vinyl off the side of your bus. And I can put a link in the description for uh, what they look like if you want to check them out and possibly get them for your bus conversion. Um, but yes, they are great. And I think that brings us to the end of that question uh, or that video.
All right, I think it's about time we just do some like rapid answer questions. I wrote some down and I'm just gonna answer them really quick and just kind of go through them. So rapid fire question number one, what year is my school bus? It's a 2004 Chevy Collins. Uh, 3500 chassis and it's about 21 feet long exterior the interior from the back seat to the back wall is 15 feet and ceiling floor to ceiling six foot four the width is seven foot six and uh, the bus that I'm currently in the big bus the big navy bus uh, is 37 feet exterior it's a 2004 uh, Thomas Freightliner it's got a Mercedes 900 engine in it the interior from the front uh, seat all the way to the back wall is about 26 feet and uh, this bus when I bought it had 170,000 miles the little bus had about had 75,000 miles now yeah, I think that answers a whole bunch of the questions next one another question coming in is is there a reason you went with a school bus over a shuttle bus um, no there's not really a reason I've kind of always wanted to buy a short bus. I just thought it'd be fun to convert. So it was kind of just like an idea in my head that I was like, I'm gonna eventually buy a short bus. Uh, in terms of a shuttle bus versus a short bus, I didn't really make a choice between the two per se. Um, I, I've done a shuttle bus conversion before for someone and I got nothing against them. I, I think they're fun builds. I, I, I will say that the one thing I don't necessarily like about fiberglass uh, shuttle buses typically is because they're already insulated and fiberglassed in like kind of like a zip panel where it's like fiberglass insulation fiberglass. So it's really hard to like further insulate those buses. Uh, and if you're ever trying to do like body work or exterior work, it's a lot of fiberglass work. And I don't necessarily enjoy fiberglass work as much. There's a lot of uh, sanding and dust and I prefer to work with metal myself. But overall, I mean, if you're looking at a shuttle bus versus a short bus or a big bus, I mean, it, it, I don't think you're gonna find a huge difference in terms of like the options between them. It's really, I think a lot to do with preference and, and what you're looking to do. All right, now we're getting into like the construction questions because we're starting the build series here. So uh, first video of the build series, first day on the short bus conversion. So it begins. So it begins with the questions on building. Here we go. So Mike asks, why did you pull the floors out? Why not just build over on top of it? This is a really good question and I get it a lot from people in terms of why do I gut the bus as far as I do? Is it necessary for everyone to actually do this? And the answer would be like, the answer is no. You, you don't have to gut all the electrical out. Um, you don't even necessarily need to gut all the sides and flooring out. It's a matter of what you're looking to do with your bus. For me, the insulation that is already in the school bus from the original factory and the floors are not something that I wanna leave behind the walls when I'm building because in my opinion, I'm gonna be dropping a good bit of money into this school bus and building it. So I'd rather start with a really good foundation and know that the products and supplies that I'm putting into the bus are gonna last in the long run. The reason why we ripped the floors out, and I probably would suggest that you do rip the floors out, is because if you watch the video over and uh, see what the floors look like underneath, there's a lot of moisture in there. There's a lot of, um, yeah, it's just, it's just disgusting. It's, it's wet, it's not gonna dry out. Um, there's not a lot of ventilation in the flooring. There's no, there's no way for that moisture to escape. And honestly, I don't really wanna build a bus on top of a floor that's wet. So I'd rather rip that floor out, reseal the floors, and then build my subfloor back in and be able to insulate it properly. Just because I don't wanna know that there's like, you know, a half inch piece of like wet plywood underneath my floor. Um, so if, if you're gonna be building out a full-time long-term home that you're saying like, I wanna travel the country for years in, I want this thing to last, rip the floors out. If you're trying just to like throw some camper together, keep it cheap, go on a couple road trips, use it on the weekends, and you're not too concerned about the longevity of the vehicle, then leave the floors in. I mean, they're not going to affect you in the first like five years, but I mean, I, I can say that from working on buses in many different ranges of quality, you're going to end up eventually with a rotted floor, and that's something that I don't want to deal with down the road. So I'd rather get the entire structure prepped and ready to go so that when I build back, I know that it's going to be able to last the test of time because it's actually going to be done right than kind of messing around with uh, wet floors and really poor insulation in the walls. So really uh, go as far as you want in a way, but my suggestion would be, you know, take your time with it and do it right and really think through how you're gonna be using the vehicle, how you're gonna be using the camper, your tiny home, whatever you wanna call it, uh, and kind of put the appropriate amount of work in to get that far. So if you don't want water underneath your subfloors, uh, yeah, consider that. Ooh, I like this question and I can answer it very quickly will you be adding a rooftop deck like i did on navi answer is yes i actually picked up the metal yesterday uh from filming this video and i'm going to be building it 
this weekend, so you'll be seeing it in like within the next week or two. We are welding up a full 8x8 uh, rooftop deck to be putting up there. Very excited about that. And uh, so yes, rooftop deck, always necessary on a school bus, <laughs> in my opinion. Next question. Where is the best place to find a school bus? The internet? Oh, this is a question I get a lot and uh, maybe we should just answer it. So, what color are you painting the exterior? Based on the soundtrack, I'm guessing blue. So, what color are you planning on painting the exterior? So, I will tell you right now that the exterior is going to have And that is gonna look awesome when it's done and I'm super excited to share it all with you and get to painting. Yeah, I hope you guys like that color. I mean, I like that color. So how do you keep the rain out? Um, how do I keep the rain out? I think I think this is a good question uh, because I, I thought of this in the videos and I've never really explained it. Um, obviously for the last few build videos, I've ripped the windows out, I've ripped all the lighting out and the bus is completely exposed to the elements at this point. And if it rains, there's gonna be water in the bus. I'm not worried about it, uh, mostly because the bus is not waterproof at this point. There's nothing on the inside that I'm worried about getting wet or getting, you know, there's no wood or anything in it. So at this point, it gets wet, it dries out. It gets wet, it dries out, and I'm not really worried about it until I start trying to waterproof and keep the water completely out. So until we put the windows back in, caulk it all up, block out the windows we're not going to use, and get more of the exterior work done, I'm not too worried about keeping the rain out at this point um, because it's not going to hurt anything anyway. Uh, one thing that I will say is that in terms of order of things, in the bus build, you're going to watch kind of the way that I'm doing this school bus and the method that I'm using. And the way that I like to build school buses is go through the entire demolition phase, get everything that you're going to gut as far as you're going to go done. Then I start the waterproofing stage, which typically means I'm going to work outside in. The outside of the bus is going to look nearly finished before I really do any work on the inside in terms of construction. And that's mostly because I want to make sure that I have all of my penetrating holes, all of my screws in, my rivets in, anything that's going to cause water protrusion done so that when I spray foam and I start putting wood in, I'm 100% guaranteed that I know that there are no leaks in the bus, the exterior is done, and all of my holes are drilled so that when I start doing the inside, I'm not going to have to backtrack or go, you know, have to drill a new hole in a new location or do anything that's just going to be super annoying. So keeping your build process in order is going to save you a lot of time later and not having to go back and fix something or drilling through a wall or a piece of wood or cutting out spray foam. Trust me, you don't want to do it. Start from the outside and head on in. Make sure that you're waterproofed. Um, but as of right now, I'm not too worried about rain. All right, and on to the most recent video about the electrical work. Um, unfortunately, I just actually posted this video at the time of filming, so there's not a crazy amount of questions just yet, but um, we can still go through and see what's already there and answer what we can find. So here we go. Um, not sure why you wouldn't keep a nice AC 12 volt system. Uh, so in this video, I pulled out the rear AC of the bus and I pulled out the condenser. Uh, I pulled it out specifically because it runs off the engine and when the engine's running and a lot of my lifestyle and a lot of the lifestyle of people living on the road are not, you're driving a lot, but you're also parked a lot in really cool locations, BLM lands, national forest, campgrounds. And in that case, that AC unit's really useless to me and I'd rather pull it out and switch it out for like a mini split or something um, or a rooftop AC unit from like an RV, something that I can run on a solar system, something that I can run on a 30 amp plug. Uh, it's going to give me a lot more control. The bus will still have AC coming out of the dash like a normal car, but when I'm parked, I'm going to have an AC built in somewhere within the bus. So in terms of that AC that was originally in the bus, it's it really just doesn't make sense for what I'm looking to use it for, so I decided to take it out. But if you want to use it and keep it in, go for it. Here's a good question about the emergency lights that are like the kid flashers that we pulled out of the school bus. Could you reuse the red and yellow lights as spotlights instead? Uh, no, I really don't think they're bright enough. If you were to uh, pull the lens cover off and let them flash at night, they're not really designed to like give a beam or like a horizontal type uh, a light. So you're just gonna kind of get like this large kind of fog that's not really gonna penetrate too far in the darkness. So uh, what I can do is I can show you what I did on this current school bus and it might be some an option out there for anyone who's kind of thinking like you want some spotlights or off-roading lights. Um, I did something pretty cool on this bus that kind of worked out for me in the long run. So on the big school bus, what I did, instead of keeping the actual emergency flashers, because in the state that I'm registered in, it's actually legal to keep those on. Um, in this bus, what I did was I switched them out for actual off-roading lights. So these are actually truck lights. 
The two inside ones are beam lights that will shoot directly out and provide good lighting. And the two on the outside are actually floodlights, which will give a nice wide beam. So the two together give me a really good exposure to the front. And I use the existing holes that were already there from the emergency lights. So that might be an option if you're looking to actually put some type of road lights on instead of just using the emergency ones, since those aren't actually gonna be bright enough. There's also another option that we're gonna be doing on the little bus that you might wanna consider. Now in reference to the short bus conversion, we're gonna be doing a bit of an off-roading system, so we wanna actually add a light bar. And a good example is actually gonna be Luke's FJ. You might know Luke, cause he's helped me on the bus build, but he's actually got a remote control to control his light bar, and it just simply turns right on. That probably blew out the camera lighting, but this is another good example. If you wanna look into the off-roading market, there's a lot of products that you might be able to use and attach on the front of your school bus that will work really well. So I got a good question over on Patreon. If you guys want to check out my Patreon and, and uh, join on over there. But I got, I got a good question from Elizabeth over on the last video. And the question is, can you use any of the wires you kept for solar panels? And um, obviously, if you watched the last video that we just did, we pulled out, I mean, hundreds of feet of electrical wire but you don't necessarily want to use them for your solar system. The wires that we pulled out were 10 to 14 gauge wires, and those are going to be fine for everything from your DC panel into the actual bus. So what I mean by that is your lights, your uh, 12 volt outlets, your max fan, your wires running to your furnace, uh, things that are going to be power supplies after the DC panel, you're perfect. You can use those wires, you can reuse them, save some money. When it comes to your solar system, it's a little bit different because you got to start looking at wire uh, sizes, how many amps they can run, and that's going to be probably looking at a lot larger wires than 14 to 10. Um, you're going to be heading all the way down to like six, all the way down to like four aught wires uh, for your battery cables. So in terms of saving these wires and reusing them, that's a great idea. You totally should save them if you're going to get your electrical system but don't use them for your solar system because they're not gonna be rated for the amount of power you're gonna be using. And uh, honestly, we can't really go into what wires you would need for a solar system in this particular video. I can try to make a video on that in the future, but just so you do know, DC panel on, you can use pretty much all those wires. They're gonna be perfect, but everything from your solar panels, batteries, inverters, MPPT controllers, you're not really gonna be using those wires as much and they're really not gonna be too, too helpful uh, and helping you wire up that part of the system, you're probably gonna have to buy larger wire sizes uh, for that. So I hope you found this video helpful. Uh, it was just, you know, sometimes I find it hard to answer every question in the comments feed. And uh, this is a really fun way to actually kind of go back through and see what people are asking and dig into a deeper parts of the conversation that I'm not touching in the vlogs. So I will say that if you want to support this channel and you want to find out a way to do it, uh, I did link all of the different types of products and things that we use on the build and that we discussed in this video in the description below. They are affiliate links, so do know that if you do click them uh, and buy one of the products, uh, Navigation Nora does receive a small commission from the sale at no cost to you, but don't even feel obliged to buy anything. If you just want to check out the resources, that's what they're there for, but do know that you will be helping out the channel if you choose to. Also, if you're interested in kind of joining the greater conversation and joining us over on Patreon, where we do live streams, question and answers, and I also post all of my videos early over there, uh, you can go check out the community over there and check out the link in the description to join our Patreon account. If you're just here and you just wanna get information about buses, building and adventures, that's great. I'm glad you're enjoying the build series. I hope that this video helped you out a lot. And I hope I see you on all the next videos and you don't have to feel at all necessary to join anything because you're already here. So I just want to say thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. And uh, I got to go put some metal on the bus so I can start filming the next episode for you. So I'm going to go get to work and uh, turn off the camera. But thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.